I think I was the only seven-year-old I knew who asked um, for a blackboard for Christmas. Hi, everyone. I was teaching my poor brother. I made worksheets for him. I drew problems for him. And he kept on asking, when is it recess? Being able to tell people what's the intuition of something and see them understand something is something I've just always loved. Let's see whether you can get started. My mom is a teacher, so maybe I picked it up. I was an undergraduate studying math and physics, and I thought to myself, well, before I become a physicist for the rest of my life, I think I'd like to sort of see the world. Uh, and I thought, well, well, the Amazon Basin, I've never been there. And I brought a whitewater raft and an outboard motor, and I started heading down river. As a result, I got to know uh, people in a large number of indigenous communities. And I think they were just sort of charmed by this clueless kid. And so I decided to start working with these communities on health issues, land rights issues. As a natural part of that, I had to learn to speak these languages. And I became so involved in that work that um, I dedicated my life to it. I've just always been interested in a broad set of subjects. I did law and I did economics and I also did some extra math classes. Economics, it was really fascinating, this kind of mixture between, on this one hand, uh, using math for something useful, but at the same time still being about people. Aspects like motivations, biases, and decision making. I think that's what ultimately drew me in. Hey everybody, how you doing? <laughs> My first class was a conflict well, class today, of radical two. feminists from the fledgling women's studies program in Berkeley. And they came in and, and I said, we're, we're going to start with medieval times. And they said, oh, this is interesting. This is going to be a history of sexuality studies. And I said, oh my, I didn't think of it like that. But OK, let's go for it. Can we test whether those ripple events are causally required? My first teaching experience was teaching human neuroanatomy to medical students, walking out in front of the class with a human brain in my hands and explaining the different parts of the brain and what they do, um, and eventually leading to the students doing dissections and figuring out uh, how to, you know, what, what goes wrong with brains during disease. Um, so that was a very hands-on start. My first class at Berkeley that I taught was a lecture class, a survey in early American literature. I had prepared a whole PowerPoint slideshow and 22 pages of bullet-pointed notes. And I stood at the podium, I turned off all the lights, and I realized not only was I not going to get through 22 pages of bullet-pointed notes, I couldn't even see them because I was standing in the dark. One of the most important things in building up a good relationship with students in the classroom is demonstrating in very concrete ways that you respect them as thinkers and speakers. And there's this constant trying to understand where they are at. Am I losing them? Are they excited? Is this too easy? Should it be more challenging? And I hope by constantly calibrating, I'm finding something useful. The classroom is a community, and we work on that for 15 weeks, trying to build a community who are striving to come to terms with problems, and we're trying to figure out a solution as a group. And I, I think that that group project is really quite extraordinary because the results aren't predictable. When I prepare for class, I feel like I'm preparing for any eventuality that I might encounter. And I might only use about 10% of what I've prepared, but when I see the conversation going in a certain way, I can pull on something to guide that conversation while I'm still listening. Many years ago, I received a, a grant from the National Science Foundation to help develop uh, new effective ways of teaching large-scale lecture classes in, in biology at the college level. Um, and one key approach that uh, we took was to use very small discussion groups led by faculty members. There's a little bit of a gap between when you finish classes and when you're ready to present in these student seminars. So I've kind of invented something the students sometimes call finance therapy. So where they, you know, come with their ideas and their problems and where they're stuck and they do kind of mini presentations. And, and I try to draw in also some other colleagues I have across schools and we we give them feedback. Our students are very verbal and they're very creative and they are really great at arguing their opinions. They can challenge you on the material, they can make new connections, they challenge each other in these discussion sections, and really they're an inspiring group. It's not just that they're learning, it's that I'm also learning. And I think that that's one of the values, not only of being a student in the classroom, but of being a teacher, is the openness to um, letting something change. 
most of the cases, this is linguistically based. What's being taught by my colleagues in upper division French is echoed in my class, is echoed in the classes of my colleagues who teach upper division Spanish or German. There's an echo, not simply of critical theory or the same books, but a, a way of looking at things, a way of listening to texts. After class, people will come up and ask, you know, how does the, the process that we learned about in class today relate to something that I learned in my psychology class or relate to um, a family member who might have had a stroke? It's really true that many of those ideas um, end up providing useful sparks, you know, back in my own research or for the research of my colleagues. So it's a refreshing and kind of rejuvenating experience to work with the students as opposed to just working in the research lab. Because the students are so good, um, you can actually bring them up to the edge, so sort of to the cutting edge of research relatively quickly, and then you can actually become intellectual partners in pushing the frontier forward. We've got different kinds of memory machines here, right? And the best thing about Berkeley students is that they're willing to read across the grain, that they're willing to take a chance, that they're willing to dive into the unknown. This mixture of curiosity, openness for very different stuff, and then this can-do attitude, just going into it, working really hard and, and doing something, that's really unique. And I think at their age, I was just a kid uh, who had sort of all sorts of enthusiasms, but um, Berkeley students are serious thinkers and uh, engaged citizens uh, in a way that I find very impressive. Every semester, I find a cluster of students who are just extraordinary. I walk out of the classroom and say, my goodness, they're really brilliant. What a privilege, how lucky I am. We know quite a bit in the brain about how these forms of memory... I feel like the, the highest calling that I have in teaching is not specifically to neuroscience, but it's to teach students how to reason in complex fields. So I really enjoy hearing what my students have gone on to do and to see that they've been successful in doing that. Being a teacher has made me a much better scholar. Anxious about that gap between writer and reader. Students ask me questions that I realize I need to answer. And it brings me back to the text that I work with. And then that brings me back to the classroom in a whole new way. Learning is not limited to one axis or one space or one moment. It's ongoing, it changes forms, it's produced by intellectual conflict and debate. To learn means that you're in the world and you're open and you're porous, you know? And that you're also willing to give back.